So, who's got two thumbs and fell behind on their schedule? Me! I had initially planned on reviewing this on Friday, but shit got in the way. So, instead you're getting it a few days late. But at least you're getting a full product instead of me putting it piece by piece and teasing it out unnecessarily long. With that said, on with the show. console-style video game RPG, more commonly known as the JRPG, much to my annoyance, was a major fixture in my development as an RPG fan, and many of the ideas and concepts in my tabletop RPG sessions and designs have reflected on it in some way or another. Granted, many of the reflections are blended in with my love of manga and Eastern folklore, but I digress. Maybe it was the era I grew up in, but a lot of that style of storytelling and gameplay motifs had become a cornerstone in the gamer and amateur designer I would become. So it's kind of funny that it would only be in the last four years that I really delved into the tabletop RPG scene of Japan. The Japanese tabletop scene, called Table Talk in Japan apparently, is an unexplored frontier that I've only recently been able to penetrate thanks to some official and unofficial translations of works. I will admit there is much in the way of unexplored territory at the time of this recording, but what I do have in front of me is fairly unique. This brings me to the subject of today's review, Tenra Bancho Zero. Described as hyper-Asian fantasy, Tenra Bancho Zero, hereafter referred to as TBZ, was originally created by manga artist Junichi Inoue as Tenra Bancho in 1997. The Zero would later be added in 2000 when it was republished with a refined set of mechanics as a new beginning of sorts for the game. TBZ is separated into a setting book and a mechanics book the former running at 250 pages, while the latter runs at 456. As such, I will be reviewing the game in two parts. Part 1 will concern the setting book, and part 2 will have the mechanics book and my final thoughts on the game itself. Though I will recommend reading the setting book first. As a final note before we begin, there is a distinction to be made with names. While TBZ will be referenced when discussing the game itself, Tenra will be used when discussing the setting of the same name. This will especially come into play when we review the setting book. The setting book opens with a mini-manga that introduces a bit of the war-torn world of Tenra and several of the character archetypes and factions. Much of this would be used in the introductory manga, but I will not be discussing that here. The rest of the book has a very red, black, and white inking pattern that's a bit glossier than the mechanics book and is very image-heavy to demonstrate the world and its inhabitants. In addition, sprinkled throughout the text will be stats for various characters and equipment. The first six chapters are referred to as Section 1, and go into detail regarding the world of Tenra. Chapter 1 details the world of Tenra itself. The land given that name is stretched into four major continents, which are further divided into provinces that hold a number of autonomous countries known as domains, each ruled by a priesthood-appointed regent. In ancient times, war was forbidden between countries until about 400 years ago when the priesthood lifted that restriction for unknown reasons, turning the land into a feudal state of perpetual war. The remainder of the chapter details each continent and major region, along with their current status before and after a catastrophic event known as the Collapse which devastated the central continent. At the end of the chapter is a rough timeline of events in the past 200 years, but it is by no means complete. Chapter 2 details the Shinto Priesthood, the largest organization in Tenra and master of much of its advanced technology. After the collapse that destroyed their capital, the priesthood was split into two factions of northern and southern courts. The former chose to act more openly and share its technological secrets, while the southern court is far more conservative. The remainder of the chapter delves into the roles of the priesthood's hierarchy, as well as the advanced technology at their call, such as the Kami network and the massive flying fortresses they can call on. Chapter 3 deals with the governmental bodies of a given domain. Much of this chapter goes into great detail on how the government works in Tenra, the way society works in the land, traveling across regions, etc. There's a lot of information here that is difficult to summarize, save to say that it is an extensive look at Tenra's society. Chapter 4 delves into warfare on Tenra. Included here is the structure of a domain's army, the means which war is declared, and the effect gunpowder and soul gems have had on the way wars are waged. 
In addition, this chapter goes step by step into the flow of a war before and after actual combat takes place. Chapter 5 is about soul gems, as well as their influence in warfare. Soul gems are red stones of rare auriculum metal, also called scarlet steel, and are usually the size of a marble which can expel and absorb spiritual energy. As such, not only are they a fixture in modern firearms and the gunblade like gem blades, but are also used by sorcerers, samurai, and shinobi to enhance their powers. I'll get into what those are later. In addition, this section covers the introduction of gunpowder by the Northern Court's open policy and its effect on warfare waged currently. Chapter 6 is referred to as a cultural addenda and focuses on a collection of cultural information that can be added into a Tenra game to add to its flavor. Said information delves into how time, direction, and currency worked in both Tenra and classical Japan. These are only recommended for the sake of authenticity if necessary, but there's nothing wrong with using contemporary terms in play. Section 2 focuses on the various peoples and factions of Tenra, and many of the items here will play an important part in the archetypes located in the mechanics book. As such, each archetype segment here will be referred to as parts in the purposes of this review. Part 1 details armors, their role on the battlefield, how they are piloted, and the pure-hearted young pilots themselves, untouched by karma. In addition, this chapter details the usage and effects of the Mekyo and Kimenkyo soul mirrors, the central control behind many of Tenra's technological innovations. Kimenkyo are a more mechanical form of Mekyo that is more like a computer than a mystical device. While they lack the raw power and karma enhancements that Mekyo has, they are easier to mass produce. Part 2 is on the form of Taoist magic called Omyo Jutsu. While this ability's users are technically referred to as sorcerers in the books, the magic is more akin to summoning. A sorcerer in Tenra, for instance, is less likely to throw bolts of lightning from their fingertips as they are to summon a shikigami, or paper spell servant, that does that for them. While the means of summoning a shikigami is the same across sorcerers, there are few rules that define what a shiki should look like beyond what a sorcerer's psyche dictates. In addition, this chapter covers the place sorcerers have in Tenra society and the means which shiki are summoned be they incantations inked on a prayer strip, a mystical abacus, or through a magic talisman. Part 3 details samurai. It should be noted that the samurai that people may be more familiar with in popular and classical fiction is referred to in Tenra simply as a clan warrior. Samurai are far different, having gone through painful surgery to implant soul gems and shiki into their bodies, losing their humanity in the process. This chapter delves further into how that works and its effect on individual samurai. Part 4 is focused on Buddhism, the primary official religion of Tenra. While the chapter does explain a bit of what Buddhism is, it is with the admission that there is too much material to merely summarize it in a few pages. Instead, this chapter focuses on its effect on Tenra, ranging from the magics that some monks can call upon to the major philosophical sects of the faith. Part 5 discusses Kijin, the cyborgs of Tenra. These are individuals who have given up parts of their bodies to replace them with powerful machinery known as Mechanica. Kijin are usually soldiers who voluntarily undergo the process, even though they may have no missing parts beforehand or are wounded from battle and are outfitted with machines to return to war as an upgraded foot soldier of sorts. Part 6 is about the Kangoki, a variation of the phrase, the unbreakable one. A kangoki is a man-sized armor without a pilot, instead controlled with a soul mirror with a karma-heavy deceased soul trapped inside. This soul, known as an asura, is wiped clean and has had its memory suppressed, but eventually cracks in that suppression will form, many kangoki being driven to madness upon recovering the memories of their past life. In rare cases, a kangoki may overcome the initial confusion and become a truly self-aware being. Part 7 details the shinobi and the ninja. Much of Tenra's description of the two will be familiar to those who are genre savvy. Hidden existence, masters of stealth, quasi-mystical powers, etc. The primary addition is how shinobi utilize soul gems, whereas ninja do not. Specifically, shinobi utilize a technique known as the dark arts to implant crushed soul gems into their bodies, allowing them to more easily access their techniques. Part 8 goes into the kugutsu, living beings carved from wood. While they can be compared to dolls or puppets, a kungutsu is treated more like an exquisite work of art by many. In spite of this, they act, learn, and feel the same way a human does, 
many not even knowing they're not a human at all. Kugutsu also have the ability to manipulate the dreams of humans as well as craft illusions, known as the butterfly dream. Part 9 deals with Analytists, also known as Mushi Sukai. Analytists utilize symbiotic insects, which they host to perform inhuman transformations and abilities. This chapter details the nature of these insects, how they are captured and bonded, and the communities they operate in, also called nests. This chapter also details a list of annelids and their effects. Part 10 is about the Oni, called Lu Tirai in their language. Oni are labeled as demons and monsters, but the reality is far different. The Oni are a far more peaceful race that prefer to keep to themselves, able to utilize the psychic power known as resonance. The primary reason they are hunted is for their hearts, which can be utilized as an energy source to power Kongoki and armors. The chapter's primary focus is on Oni society, their lifestyle, artifacts, and the recently established Oni Dominion, which was a key factor in the collapse which destroyed the central continent as I mentioned before. Part 11 deals with the Shinto priesthood's agents. While an earlier part of the book dealt with the schism between the northern and southern courts, this chapter is more about how it operates as a whole. Details are given to the Kami network the priesthood utilizes, as well as its ranking system and the importance of wearing masks, especially by the southern court. Part 12 is our final segment on the various character types and details the Ayakashi. Ayakashi loosely translates to words similar in concept to fey, spirit, and monster, which is a fitting metaphor for what the Ayakashi are in Tenra, a varied force with little in the way of true knowledge about them despite the reality of their existence. Ayakashi are a catch-all for the strange ghosts, demons, and supernatural phenomena in Tenra. The chapter further delves into the nature of how they operate, their classifications, and the unique means in which they are defeated. Our final chapter in the setting book presents several organizations which can potentially be used for TBZ sessions, detailing the faction's methods, goals, and primary members. These are meant as story seeds for play which emphasize certain aspects of the game. Some are themed around certain archetypes, while others are general mercenary bands or armies. In part 2 of this review, we'll look into the mechanics of the game, as well as give the final thoughts on the game itself.